Letters of St. Severus of Antioch From a collection of letters of Severus of Antioch Translated from Syriac and edited by E. W. Brooks Published in 1915 and in the public domain Letter 82 Of the same from the eleventh letter of the first book Quote, Hungry men he filled with good things and rich men he sent away empty End quote. For the Jews who thought that they were rich and the riches of the divine scriptures became empty of these, and the nations who were hungry with the hunger of the word of God, as the prophet Amos said, were filled. This our Lord himself also foretold to the proud Pharisees, who were to fall completely away from the principles of the divine scriptures. Quote, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and shall be given to a people that shall bring forth its fruits. End quote. Letter 83. Of Mar Severus to John. We say that according to the letter, the law was abolished through Christ, but that in the spirit it was much more fully brought to confirmation. But what were the things of the letter? Sacrifices, sprinklings, various temporary cleansings repeated at stated times, and other similar things which were different from the heathen demon worship, but prefigured the truth as in a shadow. As Paul also says, quote, for the law contained a shadow of the future good things, not the very image of the facts, end quote. In the same way, Gregory the theologian also, in the homily on the Holy Spirit, wrote thus, quote, the first when it cut away idols, conceded sacrifices, the second when it caused sacrifices to pass away did not forbid circumcision. But afterwards, when they had once accepted the suppression, they conceded even what had been conceded. The one sacrifices, the other circumcision. And they became instead of Gentiles Jews, and instead of these Christians, having by a gradual change of position been brought near to the gospel. Let Paul persuade you of this, who from circumcising and being purified was brought to say, But as for me, my brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I continue to be persecuted? This one is a matter of the dispensation, the other of perfection. That God permitted sacrifices in order to lead men to shun idolatry, Moses also testifies. Since in Leviticus he wrote thus, after he had said that those, men of, his, that those of Israel were not allowed to perform any kind of sacrifice in another place besides the tent of witness, quote, and they shall no longer perform their own sacrifice to the vanities after whom they themselves go a whoring. End quote. When therefore we say that the enactments which were laid down for that infant people who were incapable of rising to the perfect service of God, that I mean which is performed through the Spirit, when the perfection came which is Christ, were in the bodily form done away, we do not sin. Let me, as if dealing with a hypothesis, test the matter. Various animals were formerly sacrificed for sin, and the blood of these was brought into the sanctuary by the high priest, while their bodies were delivered to be burnt outside the camp. This kind of sacrifices therefore symbolized beforehand the great sacrifice which balances the great sin of the world. As Paul also says, quote, For as for those animals whose blood was brought into the sanctuary because of sins by the high priest, the, blood, the bodies of these were burnt outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, in order to sanctify the people by his own blood, suffered outside the gate. End quote. Since then Christ, the Savior of all, was sacrificed in the original model on the cross, and is also slaughtered, so to speak, every day on the altar, and is distributed to the believers limb by limb by the hand of the priests. Who is so mad and so exceedingly uninstructed in the greatest matters as to dare to deny that the type was abolished in the letter? that is according to the bodily form, and the sacrifice of animals has ceased. But the intellectual meaning was also preserved according to the spirit, in which the truth was prefigured through it. After the same manner also, the eating of unleavened bread was abolished according to the letter, but according to the spirit it is still maintained, in that we keep the feast not in the leaven of wickedness and bitterness, but in the unleavened bread of purity and truth. But we will grant, if you wish, that the wax represents the letter, and the bronze that has been melted is the perfection in the spirit. If then it is the fact that when the bronze is brought to the fire, it is reduced to non-existence, and the wax, when liquefied, gives to the bronze the shape only of that which was fashioned. Explain if you have any abundant store of wisdom. 
But if the wax has been dissolved and liquefied, the letter will be dissolved. But the spiritual meaning of the law will remain, preserving the form of the letter, where Cyril teaches, and says, quote, We have not relegated the types to utter desolation, though certainly to partial desolation. I mean since the letter of the bodily observances has ceased. End quote. Listen to the expression of Gregory the theologian, and let the words of that man and his thoughts be a law to you, and a fixed ordinance, since they are indeed such to all Christians. When in the homily on the Passover he discussed the meaning of all the rites performed at the old Passover, he also caused the hearer to pass from the letter to the spirit. For when he came to the staff and solved the riddle of this, he commanded the man who eats this our Passover in truth to lean upon the staff of faith, using these words, quote, Stand firmly, with feet strongly planted, being in no point shaken by the adversaries, nor carried away by words of plausibility. These things Christ fulfilled, the subverter of the letter, the fulfiller of the spirit. End quote. If the letter kills, but the spirit gives life, and Christ is life as it is written, quote, when Christ our life shall be revealed, end quote, how can it be that when the life came, that which slew was not abolished? Since if you deny that the law was abolished in the letter, but brought to confirmation in the spirit, Paul also will be seen to say contradictory things, writing in one place that he annulled the law of commandments and, and teachings, and saying in another, do we therefore annul the law through faith? Far be it. No, we establish the law. Recognizing the commandment as holy and just and good, and in another sorrowfully crying to those who chose after recognition of the truth to live by the law, quote, you who are justified in the law have been annulled from Christ, you have fallen from grace. It is a thing impossible, that of the same object he should say, that it has been annulled and openly confessed that it has been established and that he should admire it as just and good while he rejects those who are justified in this and asserts that they have fallen from the grace that is in Christ. For it seems to some extent likely that we shall remove the enigma from doubt if we look carefully at the words of Gregory the theologian, for he called Christ the subverter of the letter but the fulfiller of the spirit. Let us therefore cleave to the law inasmuch as it has been fulfilled, but let us neglect it, let us, let us make haste to eradicate it with the swift foot of the word, inasmuch as it has been abolished, rightly treating its bodily observances with contempt. No, you say, but that holy man says that the letter was abolished, while you say the law, inasmuch as you said that Paul is a subverter of the law. Rather, from that which we have said, you have the certain truth which was before likely. When Paul says that the law of commandments was annulled, we say that he means according to the letter it was annulled, trusting to the words of Gregory, and there is therefore nothing that prevents me also from calling the letter the law. However, if you desire to hear one of the fathers saying that the law was abolished when he should have said the letter, we will readily produce this citation also for you. Letter 84, of the same, from the twentieth letter of the eighth book. To the monks of the house of Mar Isaac. But the abomination of desolation, for you asked this also as well. Daniel the prophet mentions at the end of the tenth vision, saying thus, quote, And in the middle of the week, the sacrifice and the libation shall be taken away, and together with these things upon the temple shall be the abomination of desolation, end quote. And a mention of it was made also in the Gospels. And John, the holy and of renowned memory who adorned the throne of the Church of Constantinople at this time, at that time, and said that the abomination of desolation is the image which Hadrian, king of the Romans, set up within the temple when he encamped against Jerusalem. For it is the habit of Scripture to say that likenesses made with hands and the graven statues of the demon worship of the heathen are an abomination. As Manasi says in the song that he set up, Abominations and Multiplied Pollutions. For it is better for us to say that the abomination of desolation is Antichrist, since it is impossible for us to interpret all the expressions contained in the gospel in the same passage like a record of scripture history. 
Of him the apostle also in writing to the Thessalonians said, quote, In order that the man of sin may be revealed, the son of perdition, who is opposed to and exalts himself against everyone that is called God, or is an object of worship, so that he himself sits in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God, end quote. For the temple at Jerusalem is termed a holy place, for it is possible for the same words of the gospel to be taken both in a historical sense, as referring to the desolation and devastation of Jerusalem, and in a sublime sense, to the complete desolation and end of the world. But for your assurance, I have thought it to be necessary for us to cite also the words of the interpretation of the man whom we have mentioned, the holy John, which are these. But he said that the image of him who came at that time, who also devastated the city, and set up the image within the temple, is an abomination. Wherefore he also called it a desolation. Letter 85. Of the same holy Severus, from the 27th letter of the second book, to Sergius the Count. You asked why our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, took Peter and the sons of Zebedee, James, that is, John, apart from the other apostles and disciples, and this when he raised the daughter of the president of the synagogue, who was dead, and again when he took them up with him into the mountain, as the text of the gospel says, was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his raiment became bright like light. My opinion is that he shows them such honors beyond the others, because they had a more especially acute mind and one that rose with the height of the deity of him who voluntarily humbled himself for us, and condescended to become incarnate, and remained in the same, and did not leave his most exalted glory in his divine height. For Peter, after he had confessed him and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, end quote, heard the plain words, quote, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood revealed it not to you, but my Father who is in heaven, end quote. And James and John, as Mark the Evangelist related, being brothers in the spirit more than in the body, were named by our Savior, Sons of Thunder, B'nai Ragash. The reason for which they merited such an appellation was that he who proclaimed, quote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, end quote loudly thundered the divine utterance from heaven and the gift of the Spirit that in truth came down thence, and stirred the attention of all nations by reason of the wonder and tore up from its roots, and as one might say from its foundations every false and human opinion that creeps upon the earth. For it is manifest that James also was rich in the same grace as his brother, according to the unerring testimony of him who honored them by one common appellation. But some have said that the reason for which those three were peculiarly honored beyond the rest of the disciples was that they specially loved Jesus, and in the same way he also too loved them, because of the virtues that were in them, as the very wise John, Bishop of Constantinople, also said in the 56th homily on the commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, where he thus interpreted the words concerning them, quote, Why did he take these? Because these excelled the others. And Peter showed the superiority by the fact that he loved him much, and John by the fact that he was much loved, and James by the answer which he returned, saying, We can drink the cup, and not by the answer only, but also by other actions. Among them the fact that he carried out what he said, for he was so troublesome and burdensome to the Jews, that Herod thought this would be a great present to give to the Jews if he put him to death. End quote. The words used by our Lord to his disciples, greet no man by the way, naturally cause perplexity among those who read the divine scriptures superficially. For greeting more especially becomes ministers of peace and teachers of a humble disposition. But it is not possible for us to take the actual injunction as bearing this meaning. For our Saviour is thereby shown to contradict himself, and to be making use of injunctions which do not agree with one another. For Matthew wrote of him that he said to his disciples, quote, And if you greet your friends only, what special thing do you do? Do not the tax gatherers also do the same? End quote. How then can he who enjoins us to greet not only those who are friends but also enemies prohibit us from greeting those who meet us on the way? Accordingly, therefore, it is manifest that we must direct the purport of the injunction to another meaning. 
It is the habit of men to visit their acquaintances who live at a long distance from them, and whom they have not seen for a long time, making this the occasion of a journey. The greeting of those persons as Luke wrote of Mary the God-bearer, that the reason for which she went to the hill country was to greet Elizabeth, saying thus, quote, And Mary arose in the same days, and went to the hill country in haste, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias, and greeted Elizabeth, end quote. Since therefore our Lord and God wished his disciples to be unencumbered and self-reliant, and that they should be very zealous for the preaching journey, he prohibited such greeting, when they were setting out on the apostolic and divine journey, lest they should give up the zeal for their journey, set before them, and enter upon the journey that is called vain, which leads aside to another path. For he wished the divine service of the gospel message and of the saving preaching, to be honored before fitting human affection, and the love that creeps upon the earth. And the approved Cyril also, bishop of Alexandria, wrote an agreement with these things in precise words and at length, in the sixty-second homily of the commentary on the Gospel of Luke. Quote, Again, how could it not be incumbent on men, who were to enlighten those that were in darkness, and to bring them to the knowledge of the truth above all others, to adopt a gentle demeanor and great affability, and not roughly shun intercourse with them, so as to refuse even to greet them. Though it indeed becomes saints together with other good qualities, to have that also of approaching people in a proper way, and giving greeting. For perhaps it would happen that those who met them were not under all circumstances unbelievers, but also some of those who shared their opinions, or of those who had been already enlightened, so that for this reason it was necessary to give them a message of love, I mean the word hail, what therefore? And for this reason Christ does not give the injunction in order that they may be misanthropes, nor does he give it in order to show honor to a refusal to offer greeting. But rather he teaches them to avoid such refusal. It is not unreasonable for us to understand that when the disciples were going round to the cities and villages and propounding the mysteries relating to the divine doctrines to those in every place, they did not then wish to do this without distraction, so as to speak, but so as to speak with leisure, turning out of the way, and making use of certain diversions, because someone perhaps wished to see a man whom he knew and his friend, and afterwards spend the time proper for teaching in gluttony, not in urgent things. Accordingly, he says that showing unencumbered zeal for the divine proclamation, they should be sure not to give attention that does not profit to friendships, but rather that which pleases God is placed before everything. And while employing acts of courtesy that cannot be impugned, and do not occupy attention, to give close attention to the apostolic business. End quote. 